it is so important to us now as an agency that we bring the homelessness talk in the conversation to include gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Well, you know, it's, it's slightly surprising to me that, that anybody from the LGBT community would not be well off, you know, but, but that said, uh, well, I, I deal with the city all the time, and all right. I know that they, they say, well, homeless people can just use services that are there for everybody else, for the broader community. And so I, I kind of imagine they might make that argument with you, that LGBT people can just use what's there for the broader community in terms of homeless shelters and employment and so forth and so on. So how, how do you answer that? I think the problem is so big, Eric, that it's no longer a thing of hiding. You can't say it, but recently there's been a special attention to LGBT issues. And every time there is a study, a major study on the needs and disparities in this community, you find high percentages of individuals that are facing either unemployment, which in the transgender community in this city is about 50% unemployment rate, and um, most of the ones that are employed make less than $10,000 a year. There are high levels of um, homelessness. In a recent study that was done by the Williams Institute in California, they discovered that two out of five trans people in the city are homeless. Now, you can say that the, you have to find out why that happens, but we know, as experience, I know that it is because the current shelter system is not set up to welcome special populations. And we are a special population with the special needs. We bring a lot of stigma because of our sexual orientation or our gender identity or gender expression. Uh, well, having been in the shelter, I, I can tell you that in the shelters you don't find an awful lot of LGBT people, or, or at least you don't find any that, that are really open about the way that they are. And so what, what happens in most of the cases is not that they are not there, it's that, that at many points in our lives we have to hide our identity. And if it's something so close as a home, as a bed, so you can rest for eight hours, and it means that you have to go back into a closet mm -hmm. while you get your sleep, you're going to do that. Okay. But m more and more we find people that are willing to come in groups. We have people that come to the shelters in groups. And once they start going through a lot of issues, then eventually they decide that they, they seek other ways to find help. So they go in groups in order to support each other, basically. To support each other, friends, to make sure they don't get attacked, and if they get attacked, that at least they respond. Uh, and, and you know, uh, the system as a whole ha has not really catered to the LGBT community. I mean, the, the homeless system a as a whole. Correct. So from, the, from a bureaucratic standpoint, you know, that, so there, there was a lawsuit of, of a particular shelter earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shelter administration said that they were going to make certain accommodations for the LGBT community. So have you followed up with them to make sure that they keep their word? Or It has been followed up with individual shelter directors mm -hmm. where we actually have, you know, there are some shelters within the city that are a little bit more welcoming than others. For example, the Adams shelter is definitely unknown. That's, that's one where we have a lot of issues. There are other shelters, that, like the In Street Village, where it's very transphobic. So sometimes we have to take our advocacy directly to the individual shelters versus looking at the big picture. Because there are several cases that um, we are not at a point where we are really welcome to address the issue in a big way. So we have to do now, basically, as we go. So that, that brings us to the question then of what, what services you would render at this shelter that aren't being rendered at, at the existing shelters? Well, the one thing we have to make sure that there is access, okay? We already know by the studies and basically by the reports on crime. If you look at how many LGBT people are arrested for loitering, for different things that are petty charges, you will find that some of them, at that point in, in, in these police statistics, that they didn't have a home. You have kids that are now making, like young kids that are now making their homes um, out of the gallery place. 
You have people living in union uh, stations. You have people living in, in the emergency shelters. There are people out there that know that we do exist and that we are seeking shelter there. So what we need to do is we need to have this access to the individuals that are not coming to the shelters because of the history of intolerance, because they are rejected, because they don't feel protected within the system itself. Shelters overall are not an easy place to be. Imagine so, when you have to deal with your own identity. And in the case of trans people, it's very clear sometimes that we are in a process of adapting to our new gender. And it's very difficult. Sometimes I have clients that rather sleep in cars, two or three people, so they have to avoid being bullied. Okay, so that also raises the question then of once they get into a shelter, once you have an entirely LGBT shelter and they get in, then, then what would you offer inside besides the obvious bed? Well, the one thing that we do here, we already do. We operate a, a drop-in center and we have direct services. A lot of them are social services, making sure people that have access to insurance, making sure that people at least have uh, access to employment so they can be independent. We have uh, social workers that come here and work individually with individuals that are facing um, substance abuse. They may be facing medical conditions that allow them, you know, sometimes um, to just move. Once they get treatment or once they get that issue addressed, then they can move on the path of security. So we do a lot of case management. We do a lot of mentorship. All of us that that work here as volunteers, we actually do a lot of mentorship and show people that, it's, that, that they, can, they can look forward having a stability. So in addition to actually having a bed, we want to, to we, we have an employment program that is targeted to this population because we have already seen cases that when people are given the support, that they do good. 11 years ago, I met this trans woman on 18th in Columbia. She was undocumented, she didn't speak English, she was totally homeless in Unity Park. When I met her, I thought that, you know, she was just hanging out. But after like uh, two weeks of seeing her, I asked her, what, why are you here every day when I go to work and when I come home? She said, I live here. So I took her under our wing and I put her through school. Now she has a legal status. She graduated from DC um, University and is now a nurse at Howard University. When you allow people the opportunity of a chance, mm -hmm. they take advantage. And just like her, we have hundreds of other individuals that face homelessness and we were just able to put them in the right path mm -hmm. with cultural competency, with acceptance, with love, and now they're doing great things. That is why we opened this agency. Because we already done that work with a few people, we want to help a lot more. Okay, so so uh, we're gonna help them get connected to employment and other things that that they need. Uh, well, that's I think that's great. I think that that's that's really uh, commendable. Yes. It is what it's needed. You know, it's it's we being an organization that is grassroots. It's it's what people want. So out out of DC, seven thousand homeless people. Do you have any guess as to how many of them might be LGBT? I don't have an estimated guess on what the homeless population, but I can tell you that out of the 750 plus clients that we have, about 80% of them have experienced homelessness at one point or are currently homeless. Because every time that we do an intake form and we talk about what the barriers and the issues that they're facing are, it always comes up. They don't have a stable home, or they're actually living on the street or in a car. Well, you know, uh, that, that information put in the proper form would, would, would really show the, the unmet need, and, and, and you might rally a, a lot of support behind that. And, and so I actually commend you for this effort, for this homeless shelter that you'd like to open up. And, and I think it's, it's a really great model that you have in mind. And having said that, Councilman Graham, Catania, and others of you on the D.C. Council, you know, we need you to get behind this thing because we, we have two openly gay council members 
who have ne never been down here to to look at this place and to see what they can do for Casa Ruby or for the clientele that comes through here. So we need you to, to get up off of your seats, out of the dais, and come down here and see what's going on and, and talk to, to Miss Ruby Corrado and find out more about this issue and see what you can do to fund this effort and to otherwise help Ms. Corrado with what she wants to do for the homeless LGBT community. Thank you.